okay, but like 5 a.m., 6 a.m., why are we paying for that? Like in the middle of the day or like prime time viewing hours, they've got reruns of old Husky football games. A, B, C, one, two, three, A, B, C, one, two, three, A, B, C. You're weird, the microphone. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's on. I can't. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Which computer are you using, Kenny? And are you going to have the question and answer panel all the way over here, really? Where do you want it? Well, standing behind the podium does not make it feel like a discussion. I mean, so the big, the, the nice thing would be is if we could get, so I can agree to this. If you or whomever can stand somewhere nearish by these people, so we can get them all at the camera. This camera, Jason, yeah, to full, full and over here. that side. No, 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 no. Yeah, this is good for the stream, for the Harborview people to be able to see that. So I'm going to give you guys a mic over here, Kenny. So you're in charge of passing this mic. Okay. You have to make sure they actually use the mic. Okay. So people can hear. That's why I'm sitting. I believe in you. 
Yes. <laughs> and then uh, I'll, and then I'll pop back at the very end of the discussion. And then when we're ready for the discussion, I got some chairs just so we can sit up there. And then I'll, 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 I'll No, no, we had a, we had a six. 
Okay, is everybody ready to get started? The the uh, yeah. Not okay. So doc, Dr. Chansky asked me to introduce our topic and speakers for this morning. It's an innovative topic that should be pretty exciting, maybe not an area we typically think of for collaboration between palliative medicine and orthopedics, but probably should think more of. So looking forward to hearing exactly how we should be looking towards opportunities for collaboration and, and ideas that our speakers have. So today from our orthopedic department we have Dr. Kenny Gundel who's one of the fourth year, soon to be fifth year residents. And from the uh, Department of Palliative Medicine we have two speakers, Dr. Wayne McCormick who's also the director of their fellowship program and Dr. Caroline Hurd um, who's in that department as well. So I'll turn it over to the trio and look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. All right. Thanks, Dr. Davidson. Uh, again, I'm uh, Kenneth Gundel. I'm one of the fourth year residents in orthopedics. And I'd just like to welcome our speakers and thank them for taking the time to come and, uh, and join us today. So today we uh, have welcome our colleagues from palliative medicine uh, for an update of their advances here at UW Medicine and hopefully uh, nudge towards our collaborations. Uh, there is actually great reason and necessity for our fields to learn from each other. Uh, we'll be beginning with a brief introduction uh, followed by presentations by Dr. McCormick and Dr. Hurd and then leaving plenty of time for discussions uh, and questions. It struck me uh, in preparing for this how the principles in orthopedics and palliative medicine uh, closely overlap. In both fields, we share a focus on improving the quality of life uh, for patients. In orthopedics, we seek this goal by improving mobility, uh, oftentimes by enabling patients to continue activities that are important to them. Granted, as part of this, we oftentimes address, although not necessarily cure, biomechanical pathologies, but we often reduce pain while benefiting the patient desired function. As we, can, as we will see, a central principle of palliative medicine is to focus not on a, a particular curing of a disease, but rather maximizing remaining quality of life and respecting the values and goals of the patient. Perhaps you may be skeptical of the overlap. Certainly, our academy's A Nation in Motion campaign reflects a common thought that orthopedics is all about getting relatively young, active patients back to the sports uh, and, and activities and their lives. These images of otherwise healthy weakened warriors who happen to have an ACL tear or rotator cuff tear are where orthopedic value is ought to be measured, uh, uh, according to some campaigns. And not only that, but this is how orthopedics contributes to the economy, uh, getting the red uh, out of these muscular anatomic netter images so that people can get back to work. And this is definitely part of orthopedics. Yet, as we know, we are facing a gray tsunami of an aging population, rising obesity rates that are the tip of a drifting Antarctic iceberg for comorbid heart disease and type 2 diabetes, a pandemic level opioid epidemic, and other natural disaster metaphors indicating what we know. Often but not always, the patients presenting to our clinic uh, seeking relief of pain and improvement of function are often older and or sicker than what is often reflected by AAOS public service announcements and not all of our treatments are benign. Uh, this would be one exception of an AAOS public service announcement about there are smarter ways to guard against falls uh, than bubble wrap uh, that I thought was appropriate. But in light of this, if we take the, as an example, geriatric hip fractures, as the population is aging and the percentage of Americans over 65 is projected to more than double by 2050 uh, to a full 20% of the population, and we know that one of the greatest risk factors for a geriatric hip fracture is, of course, age, that the number of these fractures is rising. I was very surprised that in, back in 2003, 310,000 hospitalizations were for hip fractures in the United States, which was 30% of the total number of inpatient admissions. Not only that, we know that the 30-day mortality for a, a geriatric hip fracture is 9%. 
but with pneumonia, it can increase up to 43%, and with heart failure, it can be as high as 65%. It's a common OITE question and otherwise in orthopedic uh, textbooks about the one-year mortality, ranging somewhere between 14% to 36%, and even much higher than that, depending on the age of the patient and their comorbidity. More, almost as importantly, the, there's a 50% chance of a loss of independence after a geriatric hip fracture. So these are common, life-changing events for our patients that we're involved in. And as the treating orthopedic surgeon, how can and should we facilitate conversations about goals of care and bringing people to understanding what this information means more than just whether we're going to do a HEMI or a DHS? There are other issues as well, cases of elective surgery where the risk of morbidity and mortality are non-trivial. For example, advances in instrumentation and surgical technique now allow for treatment of things such as surgical drop neck deformities or long spine fusions. But as we have published from this institution, there is an, uh, after uh, fusions of the thoracic spine to the pelvis in an adult population, uh, there is an estimated 4% uh, mortality rate. 12% risk of a major medical complication, and a 35% rate of unplanned returns to the operating room. Just as a, I'll just kind of read through a case vignette of a 75-year-old man with obstructive sleep apnea on CPAP, controlled diabetes, stable coronary artery disease with previous stents, who has uh, activities of daily limiting, precluding pain and neurogenic claudication from severe adult spinal deformity. Having tried all forms of non-operative treatment, fusion from T10 to pelvis is offered. Before his symptoms had worsened, he enjoyed going on walks, seeing his family, and is proudly independent. Postoperatively, he has difficulty weaning the ventilator related to his obstructive sleep apnea. He eventually develops a pneumonia and also requires a return to the operating room for an early surgical site infection. Two weeks postoperatively, he continues on the ventilator, and now a tracheostomy is considered. Palliative care is consulted regarding goals of care. This is not the result that we want or predict after an elective surgery but it does happen. And what might we ask preoperatively to help guide decision making at this point? Or is there even a role for a preoperative consultation in high risk patients? So with that uh, brief introduction and kind of framing some of the, the issues at play, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. McCormick to begin uh, their presentation. Thanks, Kenny. And thanks for having us today. Uh, the last time I was here, I think was what was it, Lisa, about six years ago, we were talking about the geriatric fracture center at Harborview, and uh, that's still an open conversation, so I was glad to see your slides about that, Kenny. <clears throat> well, I'm gonna do a general introduction about palliative care, not just in orthopedics, but kind of generally to give you a flavor of the medical, medical environment nowadays, and to talk a little bit about the Center of Excellence, which exists here at UW, which is a resource to all of you when you're taking care of very ill people, like the one Kenny presented, a geriatrician would look at that case of the 75-year-old, and we would call that multimorbidity, which is just another made-up term to signify that it's not any one thing. It's not just his sleep apnea, ju not just his diabetes, not just his coronary artery disease. I any one of those is amenable to therapy. But in aggregate, the sum is more than the parts. You know, his uh, projected mortality may be much higher than any one of those individual diseases might make us think. And consequently, it may be predictable that he'd have a difficult perioperative course. Our job in palliative medicine is not to talk people out of surgeries who have multimorbidity. It's to address people's individual goals, which Caroline is gonna talk about. If this guy, in consultation with you all, thought the best thing, you know, he, if his goal was, you know, I want to walk by the beach one more time, and whenever it takes to get me there, that's my main goal, in which case we would be right behind you to see if we could get him through the perioperative course. The guy could have done okay, right? I mean, it was, you know, interesting thing hap things happen, both negatively and positively. He might have done fine for a while. Uh, and that's what we would be hopeful for, and that's what we would support, even as palliative medicine providers in consultation with you. So I'll give you a brief overview. We'll talk a little bit about primary palliative care versus specialty palliative care, the kinds of things you can do as orthopedic surgeons in the primary role to help people with address their goals and with palliative medicine decisions, 
and it's part of what's in the handout today, so grab a handout about some simple language about that. We'll delve into goals of care conversations, which Carolyn will dip into a bit, and opportunities to collaborate between the two of us. So here's kind of the old model of palliative care. We would, like the case that Kenny presented, we would work hard on disease modifying therapy, We're working hard on the guy's sleep apnea, on his glucose control, on control of his coronary artery disease symptoms. And then when, it, when it's pretty obvious that he's dying, then we jump in with palliative care and hospice type care. It's kind of a bright line separating the two. This is kind of the old model though. The newer model is we want to integrate and build palliative skills along the way. So we blend palliative and curative type medicine uh, together all along the course. A, a good example of that is what happens at children's hospital these days. Uh, when kids come into children's with any malignancy, uh, primarily the leukemias, but also uh, solid organ or tumors, uh, the palliative medicine team is just part of the oncology team not differentiated, not otherwise labeled. There's a palliative medicine representative when those kids come in the hospital. And they travel along with the kids through their course in the hospital. Now most kids with leukemia these days are cured permanently. And when that happens, everybody celebrates, including the palliative medicine provider. But in those few cases that don't go so hot, then the palliative medicine team comes forward in force. But that's the way the blended care exists all along the continuum of care. So in that situation, it's applicable at all stages of illness at the bottom of this slide. <clears throat> so the new model is we blend palliative care with the disease modeling therapy. And this is where we kind of work together along the way. If things look terrible, we can help jump in and just be part of the team. If uh, things go better, great, we'll all celebrate things don't go so hot, then we come forward in the model. And then we're able to more comfortably blend into life closure and hospice type care if and when it's necessary. Often it's not. So the idea here is to provide care to patients and families that reflects their personal values, belief, and goals. Their human ones, not so much their medical ones. So for the case Kenny presented and that I uh, changed a little bit. If the guy's goal was, I want to walk one more time by the beach by myself, then you know, we'd further that goal, that human goal that would involve medical care and, orth and the orthopedic procedure, but we'd, we'd further that with you. Here's an interesting study. This is in the oncology realm uh, that was done at MGH by Jennifer Tamell about early palliative care using this blended model where the palliative care team's just there from the beginning versus controls for people with metastatic uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And what this group found was that early palliative care improved quality of life for patients generally, regardless of their survival, by quite a wide margin, improved their depression scores by quite a wide margin, and surprisingly enough, early palliative care, actually, the people lived longer. Now you might wonder, well, you know, what could that be? Like talk them out of chemotherapy that was gonna kill them otherwise? Actually, there's a lot of evidence that chemotherapy helps people survive longer. Otherwise, oncologists wouldn't use it. Uh, but it was probably based on the fact that often when patients are empowered, they know their personal goals better than we probably do. And that to the extent we can buy into that, it's empowering, so empowering that it might actually change people's survival patterns. So surprisingly enough, even though these were matched uh, cohorts, the people who got palliative care, even though they had metastatic lung cancer, survived a little bit longer than people who got uh, aggressive standard care. So that's interesting. And even though there's, a, you know, this is a little bit antique now, but there was talk about death panels a few years ago before the depression. Uh, but it, it, it seems that it's actually important to patients and families when they learn more about palliative care that they actually agree that this should be something that's available. And it should perhaps be a top priority when you just talk to lay people, citizenry, about what should be available to us uh, in general. 
And it turns out palliative care, actually the financials are fairly favorable. For people who need palliative care, it turns out at our hospitals and at other hospitals, this particular study is from Sean Morrison at Mount Sinai in New York, but it turns out that both there and here at UW, at UWMC and Harborview, it appears that people who receive palliative care consultation tend to be uh, a little bit more cost averse than people who don't. It seems like it might actually save money. Not by talking people out of things, by recognizing their goals and working with them to achieve those goals. Here's a little bit about primary versus specialty palliative care. Primary palliative care is what you guys do all the time. You are way more skilled at talking through informed consent than we are because you do it every day. Oh, and, uh, talking to people about the risks and benefits about, of procedures. And as a result, you're driven by patients' goals. Primarily their mobi mobility, but other goals as well. When you get the sense that things are diverging, that's a little more complicated than just mobility goals, then there's other language you can use just to make sure you understand where people are headed. And I'm sure all of you have been in the situation where you're dealing with a patient perhaps at advanced age with lots of diseases that, that perhaps don't uh, want the procedure you're recommending or shy away from it. The 98-year-old little old lady in the Harborview ER who's just had a, a femoral neck fracture and who has advanced COPD, frailty, et cetera, says she doesn't want her hip repaired, even though you, in your judgment, are quite certain that you could help her with her mobili mobility uh, and that you could probably do her some good even though she's pretty severely ill in an advanced age. She refuses. Well, exploring her goals, what's important to her as a person, not so much medically, might help you reach some consensus about deciding to either be more forceful in talking her into it or embracing the fact that maybe this is one of these cases where we don't necessarily need to operate we can concentrate on good comfort measures. So that's primary palliative care that you guys do, uh, whether you recognize it as, label it as such or not. And then if things get complicated, it's okay to call us in to help with cases like that. That's what we're here for. But we are broadly trying through the Palliative Care Center of Excellence to encourage primary palliative care in all disciplines, all the surgical disciplines and all the medical disciplines to help that so people's skill set is generally advanced. So we think about prognostication. I talked a little bit about multimorbidity. In people like the uh, case that Kenny presented, people in their uh, late 70s, 80s, and 90s who have more than three or four diseases that can be ameliorated but can't be cured, and have either functional and or cognitive debility. That's what a geriatrician would call multimorbidity. And for people who have multimorbidity who are geriatric, the survival curve is roughly similar to people with metastatic colon cancer. So that would be the prognosis of this fellow that Kenny presented. Now, some people with metastatic colon cancer do pretty well these days. They survive quite a while. Uh, so that's great, but just most don't. So we just recognize that that's part of the prognosis in people like that. We do values-based shared decision-making with the human goals we talked about, and that can lead to advanced care planning. So I think at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Caroline to take it forward. Thank you guys so much again for having us. So I'm gonna to try to delve into, um, again, more, what we wanna focus on today is those primary palliative care skills. So these are things that all of you, a lot of you are probably already doing. Um, so talking about those a little bit more in depth and trying to expand those, what can you do with the patients that you're seeing? Uh, and, um, and then also talk a little bit at the end about what possibly we could think about doing in clinic, clinic um, possibly with your uh, medicine colleagues in the pre-op evaluation. So. Um, so I think about process, the process of goals of care is really having four key steps. So Wayne talked about the first one, which is really getting all of your information. What's the prognosis for this patient? What's the medical facts that I need to know when I'm talking to this patient or this family? And then the next step, what we think of as the patient narrative, what is their story? What's important to them? What are their values? And then how do we integrate both of those together and come up with an individualized care of plan? 
And so we're going to talk about these a little bit more specifically. So I want to introduce you to two, two gentlemen. Um, so these both come into your ER with a new hip fracture. We've been talking a little bit about geriatric hip fracture. So the one on the right, um, this is no Norbert. Norbert's actually my uh, grandfather uh, and who died actually just this last fall at 99. So, um, so this is Norbert. And on, on the left is Amir. Amir was a, or sorry, you're right, um, is a 94-year-old gentleman who I met at Harborview also this last year. Um, and so we'll kind of walk through their story a little bit and kind of, and, and kind of see what happened to them over their course. Uh, and so, so the first step is really this prognostication idea, um, and Wayne talked a lot about that multimorbidity. And you know, there's a lot of different scoring systems. And as I was preparing for this, I was looking at different scoring systems in orthopedics, whether those are things for people who have metastatic spine disease or for those who are going undergoing hip fracture surgery. And you know, for me, when it when I'm thinking about talking to patients and families, and what comes out to me the most is really this idea of frailty. Um, and I think the nice thing about frailty also also is that it can really apply across, um, across age groups. So whether that patient is in their 50s with a ton of morbidity, um, comorbidities, or whether that person is in their 90s. Uh, and there was a nice study that was just done, and I have that, there's um, kind of the summary of the frailty score is in the handout um, that was by the door that you can grab. But this is a nice study. It was just published last year in the Canadian Medical um, Association Journal. And this was a multi-center prospective cohort study. It had over 400 adults in the study, and a decent proportion of them were actually post-surgery, so they'd had surgery within the last 48 hours. Um, they were admitted to six ICUs in Canada, this was in Alberta, and two of them were academic centers and the rest were community centers. Uh, and they had to have a stay that was over 24 hours. And they followed these patients um, over the course of their, of their time um, in the hospital and also for an, a year after. And what they did was they, they classified people based on their, whoops, let me go back, on their frailty scale, uh, which I feel you know, again, a lot of these scoring systems you need to kind of take into account. You need to total up the score and, okay, where does this end me? And then where does that end up being in terms of their mortality? And it can be complicated and I think something that can be a little bit harder to do when you're really at the bedside. Whereas I think this is something that can give you that more general sense of somebody's, um, about how somebody is going to be doing. And so the, this goes from one, being very fit, um, somebody who's completely independent, very active, all the way to very severely frail. This is somebody who's completely dependent. This would really be um, both the terminally ill and very severely frail. These are the patients you'd be thinking about who might be on hospice um, or considering hospice, and then everything in between. And so these, these folks had a um, frailty score of to be considered frail in the study of four or greater. So four is, while not dependent on others for daily help, often symptoms limit activities. A common complaint is being slowed up and or tired during the day. So that would be from four up, um, is what, what was considered to be frail in this study. And if you look at these patients, so a much larger percentage of them had adverse events during the hospital stay, and, and there was almost double the um, mortality rate in the hospital. And what was interesting about this was that um, actually their ICU mortality was the same, but their overall hosp hospital mortality was higher. And so these patients were actually doing fine in the ICU, and they actually got the same level of aggressive care in the ICU. So this included blood transfusion, pressors, dialysis, tracheostomies, those were actually the same across these two groups. Um, but what was different was really this death in the hospital, uh, which I think is oftentimes we're able to kind of get these patients out of the ICU, but they end up going to the floor, and then they have delirium, and then they're maybe even back in the ICU, and then back to the floor, and then end up, end up, end up dying during the hospital stay. So a third of these patients um, didn't survive the hospital stay, and a very large percentage of them were newly, independent, or newly dependent when they left the hospital, and a number, a high number of them were readmitted within that next year, and their length of stay was also incredibly long. So 30, day, um, 30 days compared to 18 days was their average stay. Uh, and then the survival for the frailty scores that were even higher, that was 50%. So again, when we, you know, Wayne gave the example of metastatic colon cancer, if this was cancer, these are really, you know, patients that we want to be thinking about doing advanced care planning, doing goals of care discussions. And so I think it helps us identify those patients. And granted, this is in the ICU, but I think that this really can be applied kind of across settings and in the outpatient setting as well. Um, and so, 
so when I think about prognostication, I think about, we talk about this idea of frailty, and it's not just are they frail, but it's also what is their trajectory of that frailty. So maybe somebody is actually quite dependent in the outpatient setting, but maybe they're actually, they've been that way for a few years and they've been managing okay. So I wanna know, okay, what, what has that been worsening over, especially over the preceding months before their, um, before their surgery? And then the second, obviously, is the comorbidities. We all know that that really increases the risk. And then the third piece is the surgery outcomes. So that obviously is for you, where your guys' expertise really comes in, is what are the benefits and the burdens of this surgery that I'm offering? Um, and that, that benefit in some cases can be a mortality benefit. I think especially in orthopedics, a lot of times that, that benefit is a, a morbidity benefit. It's a quality of life benefit. It's a functional benefit. And that that is really important. There's a lot of situations, I think, again, metastatic spine disease is a good one, where the mortality may not necessarily be hugely changed, but their functional status, their pain, their quality of life could be dramatically impacted by that, even if their life expectancy is on the shorter, shorter time frame. And so that, that is obviously really important. And so combining these things all together end up being your total prognostication. And so that's just a piece of it, right? And so if we look at these two gentlemen, so when we actually got more information about Amir, when I sat down and talked with his family, it turns out that Amir was really, is really quite functional. So he's again 94, he, is, he walks about three miles a day. About earlier, about a few months earlier to this hip fracture, um, he had been climbing a mountain. He plays balderdash with his family every Sunday. Um, so cognitively, he's very there, has a good humor, good sense, good wit about him, um, was an accountant and was really working actually up until I think they'd said he'd retired something like two years previously or something. So, so, so obviously very functional. So my grandfather Norbert, on the other hand, when he had his hip fracture, he was really, at, he had end stage dementia. So he had just um, about a month or two before had been put into a nursing home. He'd been otherwise living in his own home, thanks to my aunts. Um, he was completely dependent in his ADLs. He'd been having more falls. He was really eating less. So his trajectory was really one of significant decline and he also had some other comorbidities that increased his risk, risk even further and so so this again is just a piece of that goals of care conversation obviously when we look at these two gentlemen we think okay their prognosis is very different and we all know that I think inherently but I think having more information about who the patient is and what their life is like outside of the hospital is important for that prognostication piece and then the next step is okay so what what more about them what's important to them what are their goals and what do they want to get out of this particular particular surgery or procedure. And so, so I'm going to walk you through what we call kind of the palliative care guided narrative. Um, and I think these are questions that you can really ask all your patients. And you actually can do these, um, you know, we obviously spend a lot of time with patients and we're happy to help you with this process. But a lot of this can actually be done quite quickly um, when you meet a patient. Uh, and if I would practice first with those situations where there's, where, um, there's maybe a lot of distress around the decision, and then hopefully these will become part of your kind of natural um, conversation with patients and then you can use them you know on on, on, on all of your patients hopefully uh, so one of the big questions I ask again is what is your life like outside of the hospital and then I ask them what their perspective is on illness this is kind of a take on that understanding piece uh, and then what's important to them what are their hopes what are their concerns and what has been their past experience with illness so this conversation for me would go something like this can you describe to me an average day for you you wake up in the morning how do you spend your time you know are you in bed are you are you walking around do you do your grocery shopping you know those sort of things I want to know how they're spending their time and then I also want to know how this has changed over the preceding months um, and then what is their perspective on their illness so what have you been told about your current situation and what is your perspective and this gets at that understanding piece sometimes when we ask understanding when I train residents there's the understanding is a big part of the palliative care kind of goals of care discussion I say well you know well, what, what do you understand about your illness and that can come across sometimes as being a bit condescending um, and so we work with residents residents on really kind of having, you really want to know what do they think, what is their take on what's happening for them, and you can get at their understanding and how they describe that to you. Um, and then what's important, what is most important to you right now? And sometimes if patients are having a hard time kind of verbalizing that, well, I talk about three things, so comfort, longevity, and independence, and sometimes that helps people bring out what's most important to them. And then what are you hoping for? What are you worried about? And have you or someone you cared about ever been seriously ill? And tell me about that experience for you. What was that like? Um, what went well? What maybe, what would, what would you have wished would have gone differently? And that can be very, very interesting. And so 
So we did that with these two gentlemen. So um, this is Norbert again, my grandfather on the right side. So his life outside the hospital, again, we've already talked about, was really one that was in decline. Um, and the perspective on, um, of the whole family was that they understood that he was really reaching the end of his life, that we saw this as kind of the final months of his life, and that the most important thing was comfort at this time, and that he had a peaceful death, and they didn't want him to be in pain, and they didn't want him to suffer, and they didn't want this process to be prolonged. Um, and his wife had died many years earlier. He was often talking about her and wanting to be with her and was very ready to do that. And he had always hated going to the doctor. And what ended up happening, they live in a small town in Iowa. When he had his fall, he was taken to the local hospital, who then did the x-rays, who then transferred him to the University of Iowa, where he then became extremely delirious, was admitted there for several days, finally got a palliative care consultation, and the decision was made for him to go back to his nursing home without doing any surgery and go on hospice. And he ended up living for another four to six weeks on hospice and then dying very comfortably. Um, but it took, and it, it was a very prolonged delirium and transfer and cost and all of these sort of things that had that discussion happened maybe at that small local hospital, then maybe those sort of, sort of things wouldn't have happened. Amir, on the other hand, again, when we talked to him, I already told you about this th thriving, very healthy lifestyle, and he was really interesting. He really felt like he was going to live to be over 100. At one point, he had some very pre, not even diabetes, but actually pre-diabetes, and his family said he was just obsessive about his glucose. And, and he, one of, he had two um, nieces and nephews who were, in the, who were uh, physicians, and they said, you, you're, not, you're never going to have, this is never going to be an issue for you. And he said, well, how do you know? You know, I expect to live to be over over 100, so this may become an issue for me. So that was really how he viewed life, um, and that he was really willing to go through, you know, some significant amount of hospital and surgery and that sort of thing in order to get back to that level of, of independence. And cognitive cognition for him was very, very important. Um, and um, but as a as a caveat, when we talked more, his wife a few years previously had had a very protracted illness. She had had a lot of comorbidities, and she had had a very long ICU stay that had been. Quite quite traumatic for him and actually the entire family. And so they were also clear that although they wanted very aggressive medical care at the time, if this was going on for several days, for weeks, that he would not want to continue in that fashion if it didn't seem like he was going to have a good chance of really returning to a quality of life that he found acceptable. So that was really helpful information for us to know in terms of caring for him and the road ahead and doing some sort of anticipated guidance about what they could expect. And so, um, so I think this is, a, this is another study that was just published last year um, by a group that does a lot of work um, in terms of um, kind of understanding what's important to people. And this was published in JAMA in 2013. And I think what's nice about this study is it really mirrors a ton of other studies that have been done in this way, which really look at what do people want and what's important to them. So these were elderly patients. These were over the age of 80 um, and a number of patients and their family members. So they asked them kind of separately to see if there was um, consistency there. And what they found is, and these were patients who were hospitalized for any general kind of condition, um, but at the time of hospitalization, what, what would you like your care focused on? And so about a third of the patient wanted solely comfort, even at admission. Another third said, well, I want an initial attempt at, at treatment, but if things aren't going well, I want to switch to comfort at this point, and I definitely want to be DNR. Um, and then you have another about 20% of patients who said, well, I want full medical care, but I don't want to be resuscitated if my heart stops. And then about 12% wanted full medical care to prolong life, including CPR. And so this, this group here is an important group for us to be aware of because, again, this reflects a lot of studies that there is probably anywhere between 10 to 20% of patients who will tell me, you know, even if I'm on a ventilator and I'm fully dependent on life support and I can't interact with my family, that that is okay with me. And that's important for us to know because that person is going to get very, very different care. We should be providing that person different medical care than we should for someone. I had a patient tell me, if I can't ride my motorcycle anymore, I don't want to be living. And that person prioritizes something very, very different and would not want to be very long-term dependent in a nursing home. And so that gets at this idea of really individualizing that care. And so, so the next step is integrating these two narratives, the medical and the patient narrative, to create an individualized care plan. And so I've tried to kind of come up with a little bit of this algorithm. What would this look like um, if you were, if you did this with a patient, and how would you kind of help them kind of make some of these decisions? And so your medical narrative, you might decide after gathering all your information, their prognosis is poor, 
moderate or, or good um, in terms of what the outcome of what, what we think is going to happen based on, uh, in your particular case, of surger, surgical intervention. And then what's the patient inter intervention or, or narrative? Do they want to focus on comfort? Do they want to focus on independence? Do they want to focus on longevity? And then, and then integrating these two. So for some patients, if, they're, if their medical narrative is that they're out, their outcome you think is going to be very poor and you actually think the benefit of this intervention is quite low um, or they're very high risk for complications long, you know, after the procedure and their focus is comfort, this would be like my grandfather, you might say, okay, we're going to choose to go to comfort care right now and we're not going to do surgery. Alternatively, somebody might say, you know, I, I, you know maybe the outcome might be poor, but I, I do want to focus on comfort, and there's a chance that I could actually benefit, even from a pain standpoint, of doing this surgery. That might be somebody who still is on comfort care, but we're still doing surgery with the goal of comfort and quality of life. So just being on comfort care doesn't mean that you then don't have access to these other therapies. Um, and then, and then somebody who maybe is focused on um, um, who who decides that maybe the Bennett, the risk of surgery, maybe their outcome from the surgical intervention is going to be very very poor. They might decide, well, I'm still going to get the other medical treatment that I want that might help me get out of the hospital, but I'm not going to do surgery because that risk is too great. Um, and somebody who then maybe has a good outcome and they want to focus on independent, you say, okay, I'm going to do surgery and I'm going to do limited interventions, meaning I want to be independent, I don't want to be long-term on a ventilator or have CPR, but I still want to do everything else. And so that's how you can kind of tailor these, these things all the way up to surgery with full treatment who would be full code. And this kind of reflects a pulse. I don't know if many of you fill out pulse with your patients, um, but I'm sure you've seen them um, on patients' charts. So this kind of reflects what somebody would, would fill out on a pulse form, essentially. And then you can go through these things. And if somebody still has a poor, a poor um, uh, outcome, but their focus is on longevity, they still might, and we will still support them in doing full treatment. They still may want to be full code, even if their outcome is poor. And in those patients, I think what's important, again, is really walking through them with the process and this idea of anticipated guidance. You talk to them about what those risks are, and not just the risks of surgery, but I think for our patients, especially that we see with these multimorbidity, we're really talking about talking about the complications after surgery. So all the infections, the ICU course, the ventilator, later, those are the sort of things that we want to be talking about and giving them anticipated guidance and knowing that this can change over the course of a hospital stay. And so, so the last piece is really then making that shared decision making. There are some patients who really want, um, they want you to make the decision for them. They want to know some of the information, but they really want you to make the, the, the decision on their behalf, um, with parentalism or paternalism. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum are those patients who want that information, but really they want to be the ones making the decision. And then we need to kind of adapt to, the, again, those different preferences. And so <clears throat> we may have a collaborative role where we're really offering a recommendation or a facilitative role where we help them place their goals and values in the context of their medical situation, and then they come up to a decision on their own. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I'm just going to kind of end up by some of the things I think that you can do to change your practice. So, um, so one is communication training for all residents. So uh, I'm working on a project I'm going to just go through um, with Tony Bach. So Tony Bach, if any of you know him, um, he's kind of been known for his work with Oncotalk. He's one of our oncologists at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and has really been known internationally for his work on communication. And he has, this is actually an app that you can get for your phone. He and I are going to be doing a project. We're in the process of making a video for family conferences and also using an app for do, discussing serious news with the pediatric residents and the internal medicine residents with the hope of then maybe doing this kind of across residency programs. Um, so hopefully that can be something that could be something that you guys could do in terms of um, investing um, even more so than you're already doing in kind of those really core skills and getting practice for your residents. And then, um, and then the last part is the pre-op advanced care planning. So um, I've been working with Rachel Thompson, who um, does our pre-op clinic at Harborview, um, and talking about how could we better identify these patients to do more of this kind of move some of these discussions up line. And not necessarily with us, but actually having the hospitalist or having um, you guys as the orthopedist participate in those discussions before surgery. And so with the idea that maybe you would screen these people on a frailty score, that could be your way to say, okay, these are the patients who we're going to do extra advanced care planning with, and then I'll show you um, the prepare 
website, but to, which is a way to do advanced care planning, which was done at a UCSF. And then maybe these are patients who you do want to complete a pulse form or you want to make sure you have actually an advanced directive completed. And if they need to, if after all this you really feel like somebody still needs a palliative care consultation, we do have an outpatient clinic at Harborview and eventually here at the U that you could refer people to. And so, so I just want to, I'll just end by sharing this PREPARE website. So this is work done out of UCSF by Dr. Sidori. She has done extensive work, has really a good funding in, in terms of doing this and really making these very patient friendly um, about how patients walking through patients, choosing a surrogate decision maker, um, deciding what matters most, what's important to people, having flexibility for their decision maker in case things don't go, don't go the way that we planned, um, and then being able to communicate those wishes both with your friends and family and then and also with your doctor and then coming up with a plan for them. So I think this is also something that can be done in the outpatient setting that you can direct patients to who you think especially are high risk of having complications. So with that, I'm going to end um, and I'm just going to pull up. Uh, yeah, and I think, yeah. Thing. So we're going to just kind of grab some chairs over there and then would like to start with, uh, you know, really have a discussion, questions that people have or things that they want to talk about more and use this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, doing this. As a more senior person, uh, I, it may be splitting words, but uh, to me, I think there is a difference between uh, curing and caring, between uh, curing and healing. Uh, when I was in medical school, survival for acute lymphatic leukemia was three weeks. So. And then we've seen these wonderful changes over a lifetime uh, of making people who couldn't walk, walk and limbs straight. And I think we've made great advances as I look at residents and young physicians in curing. But we have not paralleled that with great advances in caring and in comforting. And uh, just as a quick vignette, when I see someone who is very ill or has some terrible birth defect or problem like that, uh, the residents and the young physicians talk in terms of uh, cures on the horizon, what's just around the corner, new studies. And where I was uh, taught was to say there is nothing more I can do for your disease, what can I do for you? So the question here is, I appreciate this bridge you're making, but is this our lecture enough? Well, it's, it's, it's really, a, as you talk about, it's a, it's a new approach to care that's coming to the fore now. I, it's it's uh, interesting to me how popular palliative care has become, not just across the US, but it's a big deal in Australia and Japan. <coughs> China, certainly in, in Western Europe, I think it's the awareness of exactly what you're talking about. And what's important is the two halves of the statement you made is essentially palliative care counseling. You said, I can't do any more for your disease, what can I do for you? Unfortunately, in the past, we stopped halfway through that sentence. There's not much more I can do for your disease or for you. Adding in that second half, you've become a palliative medicine provider. What can I do for you as a human being is the sentence we're now adding back in. It's interesting. It's not new, though, because when we didn't have a lot to do with diseases, there was increasing focus on what we could do for the person with the disease. So this is like rediscovery. Of course. I agree with you. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. This is a rediscovering. And I, and, I, and I think this is really getting back to a core piece of where medicine started, really. And I think, I think although, you know, I think it took in some ways palliative care specialists to kind of remind us that this is there, but that's why the focus of today is really on primary palliative care, which is what are we all doing for caring for patients? Um, and, and bringing back that care aspect. And, and I think the nice part about this is that I think it, we all want to do that. 
ultimately. I think we are, we are just, a lot of times we've been so focused on a lot of the new technology and the new operations and all of these sort of things that are obviously very important, but we spend such a vast amount of time of our training, both in medical school and especially in residency, focused on those things that we forget this other aspect. And this other aspect, when they've looked at this for patients and families, the patients and families actually care more about your bedside manner than they do about your medical knowledge. And that, I think, is something that is so surprising. So how you interact with them is what they're gonna remember. Obviously, they're gonna be happy if their surgery went well, but how you interact with them is what they're gonna remember long term. And so I think it's a resurgence of kind of coming back to really some of our core values in medicine. And that's what I think is so exciting about it, is it doesn't have to be done by specialists, it can be done by all of us, but how do we shift that culture back to having that be a, a parallel importance to things? And I think a large part of that is in training, especially in residency where it has been. I did a, a, a needs assessment actually of just our residency programs here, and you would think, so family medicine was really the only residency program that was doing any sort of intentional communication <coughs> curriculum, and even within their curriculum there was very little, uh, well not little, but a smaller amount in terms of palliative care and end of life um, communication. But really, I mean, in internal medicine, which I trained here in internal medicine, there I got no formal training in communication, and that's internal medicine. And so, you know, I think I think we, there's a lot of room for improvement, and a big change is going to be the new ACGME and the milestones. And your patient communication is going to be a milestone for you. That's an entrustable physician professional activity you are going to be able to need to do by the end of your residency. And so, I think that has provided an incentive for residency programs to do more communication training with their with their residents. I, I came in a little bit late, so I might have missed it. But uh, how do the economics, current economics of medicine today, affect palliative medicine uh, decision making? You know, in that vignette you showed, you tend to pelvis for someone who's very ill is a very expensive treatment. And I don't mean to sound callous about this, but a lot of healthcare dollars are being spent in the last six months of life. And how does that affect what is actually qualified, what is acceptable to be included in palliative medicine? There have been a number of economic studies about you know, where palliative medicine is strong, comparing people who receive palliative medicine interventions versus not. There's pretty consistent information that overall a palliative medicine approach seems to save money, uh, seems to reduce costs. Now, in the, in the fee-for-service realm, that's not necessarily a financial lever. You know, you, it, for a big healthcare organization, often we're trying to maximize for mercenary reasons, we're just trying to keep stay in business, uh, and that's legitimate. In the, you know, towards the end of this decade, as a kind of a, a, a care organization, behavior starts to pervade medicine in general and UW medicine in particular. We've been hearing a lot about accountable care organization behavior. Then the vectors tend to line up a little bit better, and there's much more intervention towards actively seeking what are patients' human goals so we can align with them. It's not just for financial reasons, although it tends to have, be financially favorable, but it's also from an insurer's standpoint. And if you're an accountable care organization, you start to become an insurer. You, you assume risk for patient populations. In that situation, you're trying to enhance people's uh, satisfaction with their care. You're trying to retain families as insured clients. So the more satisfied a family is with the way care goes for an elder or for another family member, the more likely they are to stay in that plan, whether it's regents or Aetna or whatever. So in ACL behavior, the vectors align better. It, it appears that a consistent finding is overall palliative medicine presence and in intervention Um, let me add just one piece of that, because I think what's interesting about the literature, too, when you look at palliative care, is that the actual mortality, so we save money, but the mortality, there's no difference in terms of people who got a palliative care consultation and didn't. And in fact, as we saw in the Tamil study, there was actually a survival benefit for palliative care. And, in, and I think the reason for that is because oftentimes we're identifying people who, A, are high risk, but also B, who don't 
necessarily want all the medical care we're providing. A lot of times patients and families don't feel like they have the option. They were never presented the option of not doing something. So they feel like they have to have the surgery or they have to have this procedure or they have to have this lab test done and they're not given the option. And so I would say from a, just a health, overall healthcare standpoint in terms of our overall cost is the low hanging fruit are people who don't want all of these things. We're not asking them and maybe if we were asking people what they wanted and what was important to them, we would be identifying people who really did want these sort of interventions and supporting them even more and identifying people who and supporting them in a different way. And so I think that's the opportunity um, there in terms of, especially in accountable care organizations when we're all sharing that cost and, and, and that risk. Um, my question is a little bit where all of this good news should be inserted because uh, Kenny uh, quoted an article from us about spine surgery and we had a very poor outcome really from uh, some very severe surgeries. And so Virginia Mason responded to that uh, article. And I recently visited their indications conference. The indication conference is made up of about 12 people and includes a palliative, I think I would put that in quotes at least, a palliative nurse and physician with a medical person with anesthesia. And the cases presented are by the surgeons who felt that they had patients they could help surgically. However, after a two-year follow-up on this, the group voted down 25% of those surgeries. And then two years later, they re-interviewed the 25 who were turned down. And all of them, none of them went on to surgery by anybody else, and all accepted the decision. And they then repeated the same study at UCLA, or no, uh, San Francisco, I guess it is, and the same results occurred. So my suggestion here is that we should insert this thinking in the indications conference, rather than once they're in the hospital and once you do things. That's just a comment from that article, but it's written by Sethi and Lebeck, and it's really a very good article. comments about that uh, and then also if they're especially in regards to either a conference but also what's happening in the, in the outpatient palliative care clinic at Harborview. Well yeah so I, I was going to just respond to that and I, I think that's great I mean I would love to see this sort of stuff moving upstream and I think I think what we forget and I think again the Tamel study really highlighted that is we forget that sometimes that our treatments can do harm and can actually make things worse especially in, in certain patients and populations. Um, and so I think, I think identifying those people you know, beforehand I think is really important. And with the Tamil study, what was interesting is that those patients who lived longer actually had less interventions. So um, they had less interventions, especially ICU care and kind of hospital care at the end of life, even though they lived longer. Um, and so I think that just highlights that. And in terms of the clinic at Harborview, you know, I think, I think it's been very interesting, and Wayne can attest to this, just the Palliative Care Center of Excellence is now, what, a year and a half? almost two years that it's been established by Randy Curtis and, and Tony Bach. Um, and Wayne and I both sit um, on that executive um, council. And uh, it has been unbelievable how much the growth has been and really the demand and the need that's out there. And so we are seeing this just firestorm of, of palliative care. And a big area for us to still continue to expand is the outpatient clinic. Um, because I think we'd like to be able to offer more of these services um, to more different specialties. So a great example is actually here at UWMC, Stephanie Cooper, who's one of our cardiologists, maybe some of you have also, she also works at Harborview um, as an interventionist cardiologist there. She's palliative care trained, and she is actually embedded in the cardiology clinic here. Every patient who's gonna get an LVAD or a VAD is actually required um, to see a palliative care specialist. So that's a way that it's been embedded. Embedded, we know those, that's a higher risk population embedded into that. And that may be the model that we go for, you know, in the future if there were a lot, you know, there's obviously a limit, limit of the number of us. Um, but I think ideally we'd like to work on those other primary palliative care skills with people, especially our medicine colleagues who would be working with you in a preoperative way. 
how could they kind of better identify those patients and work with you guys beforehand so you can really identify who are the best candidates and who wants to undergo these procedures? So this is more an observation than a question, uh, but, but one of the things that I often encounter uh, more in the area of uh, geriatric hip fractures, but also uh, cancer patients, is that for some reason, I think medicine doctors and oncologists are sort of genetically uh, overly optimistic uh, or more optimistic than, than a typical surgeon. And so I find that we are often discussions of palliative care has to be informed by judgment, uh, data. And I feel that we are often in the position uh, as the surgeon uh, of uh, really sort of arguing against that optimism. Uh, and there seems to be very little sort of understanding that there are limits to technology. And just because you can fix a hip fracture or put an implant in, that doesn't mean that it's better than Then I'd say the same thing uh, in the in the tumor realm, where uh, and Darren and I have actually talked about this a few times. Where you know your sense is, and, and I would say we probably more often than not not end, end, end up being right that somebody might have weeks, you know, to a month, uh, and somehow that becomes well, it could be six months, it could be a year, and so uh, the question is, what role do you play? How do we improve uh, the communication between services? Well, I can hit that. First of all, your observation about internists and oncologists is correct and has been scientifically demonstrated to be, <laughs> to be correct. Uh, internists and oncologists, on average, are more optimistic than is warranted. So the first step to ameliorating that is recognizing is demonstrating that that's the case. And I think that a lot of internists and oncologists are A, surprised at those findings, which are fairly recent, but B, actually recognize that that is the case. They, it's a look in the mirror. So the more we can communicate about those kinds of things and actually learn from you, uh, perhaps a more realistic view from your gaze, uh, the healthier it is. And the further upstream we can have that conversation, probably the better it is. So I would completely concur with your observation. Yeah. I would put in a plug for Tony, uh, since you've been talking about him, because in many of these difficult situations, over the years, we, we got to know each other at the VA when he was there for a long time. But he is just phenomenally helpful in these situations. Even I've even used him when it hasn't been a cancer-related thing. So we need more all of you. I would, I would agree. And, you know, I mean, so uh, one example that comes to mind um, was a patient I took care of this winter who was a gentleman who came in with a new diagnosis of lung cancer and who had spinal meds. Um, and he ended up, we ended up getting consulted well into his hospital stay. I think by the time we were called, he'd been there for three weeks. Um, and he'd already had his surgery and he wasn't, he, he had, I, I forget how long he had had, um, you know, no mobility in his legs. So he wasn't getting that back, uh, but it was really with the hope of at least not having it worsen or, or improving symptoms. Um, but when we saw him, his tumor, he, his tumor was actually quite large and was compressing one of his main stem bronchi. And so when, when even aside from the surgery, when I just looked at him medically, in addition, he had terrible COPD. This was a gentleman who really had not had any, any medical care as well, you know, was severely deconditioned, had already been losing weight. When I looked at him just medically, his prognosis was extremely short. He was already severely symptomatic from his cancer in and of itself. Um, and really wasn't doing well from a medical standpoint. And so that probably was somebody who probably shouldn't have had surgery when we looked at his prognosis in general. Um, and he ended up dying in the hospital of respiratory failure. So, you know, I think, I think those sort of, and had we been consulted when he first came in, you know, some, so screening is one of the things that we would do potentially in the hospital where somebody comes in and their diagnosis is especially newly diagnosed metastatic cancer, we would be automatically consulted in some of those patients to follow them, to have those conversations early on, to then be able to make 
kind of just to, to do decision making with them because what ended up happening was he ended up being so sick especially post-operatively and delirious and all these other things um, that he um, wasn't able to go home and spend time with any of his family and there have been some other unfinished business he wanted to deal with so we forget that we then take away some of those other things so I think screening is one of those things that we could potentially do but I think a lot of times we also just navigate the pro the discussion around prognosis and we call ourselves kind of the big picture doctor we're the kind of doctors who kind of step back and say okay, what's the big picture here? When we combine all of these things together, how is that person going to do? You know, when an oncologist looks at their studies and they're looking at people who enter into a trial who have an ECOG of one or two, which is somebody who is spending more than half of their day up and ambulating, those are not the people who we are seeing in the hospital generally. Not in all cases, but generally those are not the patients who we're seeing. And those same survival benefit is not going to apply to those patients. And I think that can be forgotten. I had an oncologist say to me just last year, you know, I d it's not my role to talk about those things. So I think there's still, a, even though here in Seattle I think we're doing a better job than even other places, but I think there's still a huge cultural shift in how we train providers. And a lot of that comes back to that residency training and that communication training like I talked about in the work with Tony. Well, once again, I'd just like to thank you so much for, for joining us today. And I think we learned a lot. I'd also like to think that maybe the fragility score and other things that you talked about today could be a way to put, put to paper our thoughts when we walk into a room and see somebody who we just kind of our gestalt is a certain way. I think that we can, you know, put it to paper in that way as well. So thank you very much for coming. I hope we all learned a lot, and thank you again. One more quick announcement before everybody leaves. Uh, we actually have Michelle Lou here. Uh, Michelle has uh, flown in for uh, to interview for the nurse practitioner job on six selfies. So I know. Uh, and and she uh, is willing to entertain anybody who wants to speak with her.